Good evening, everybody. I'm Melissa Wilkinson from the Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Work Network. I sit in the education team on the Central Coast. I'd like to acknowledge the local custodians of the land in which we're meeting this evening and honour elders past, present and emerging. A little bit of housekeeping this evening. Uh, we are being recorded and a copy of this will be available in the Education Library over the coming days. Uh, there will be a poll as usual at the end and I strongly encourage you to please complete that. That's how we get uh, our feedback and our data to use and utilise for future planning for education events. So please complete that and it takes a couple of minutes and we really appreciate it. Also the chat box, if you have any questions, can you pop them in the chat box and we'll endeavour to get to those. We've got a lot of content to get through tonight um, and so we'll keep it moving but we endeavour to get to those questions and I will forward them to presenters any of it that don't get answered uh, will get forwarded on for you as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to the beautiful Olivia Gregg from Central Coast LHD. Thank you, Olivia. Um, and thank you for being here tonight. I'll head over to Olivia. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, everybody. Good evening, all uh, wonderful GPs on the Central Coast, my colleagues at CAMS and at Headspace. My name is Olivia Gregg. I'm the clinical nurse consultant and GP liaison for child and adolescent mental health on the Central Coast. Um, last month, we had uh, Dr. Gordon Lau present on uh, youth and gender dysphoria. The feedback we got from uh, all the uh, GPs that attended was how wonderful this presentation was and the need for more education and more information around that topic. Certainly, myself and my uh, colleagues, whether we work in mental health or in primary health, we acknowledge and, re and recognize the fact that this is such an important and relevant topic, uh, especially for our cohort of young persons that we see on daily basis at child and adolescent. I am eternally, eternally grateful to Dr. Goodyear and Mel Davies for the generosity in time and, um, and knowledge to offer to present this session to all of us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Goodyear. Thank you, Mel Davies. I won't rattle on anymore. And I'll hand you over to Dr. Goodyear. Thank you. Me. Um, thank you, Olivia, for um, and Mel and other Mel for that lovely introduction. Um, I've been working in. So my name is Yolandi. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Um, I can see adults as well, but <laughs> I just choose not to. Uh, I've been working with gender diverse young people um, for about seven, eight years. Um, it's still a field that I'm really interested in. And um, I am very lucky in that I can do this um, in my private rooms and that I've recently officially joined um, My Belief House, which is where Mel and I work together. Um, my Belief House is, um, uh, has been around for about a year, formally, and we are a multidisciplinary team that looks after gender diverse young people up until the age of 24. Um, what I'm talking about today is pretty jam-packed, so I'll skip through a whole bunch of slides just to make sure that everything fits into our allocated time, but it will be recorded and I have sent the slides through so that you can look at it afterwards. If there's any questions, just stop me. If I get really nervous and accidentally say a swear, I am very sorry. My mother did teach me better, but um, I don't always listen to my mother. Um, I will just quickly work this magic here. Okay, so this currently is what we would call the um, queer, the queer alphabet. Don't worry about all of the letters. Basically, it means that trans and gender diverse people form part of the LGBTQ plus umbrella, but every one of those letters are really quite distinct. Today's talk is about the T's, transgender. Transsexual is really very old school, so it's in there more for historical purposes. And we'll also talk a little bit about the Q, which are people who are questioning, and the other Q, which is queer. Intersex folks fall under this umbrella, but really, I will not be talking about them today. 
I really like this slide as just a summary of the work that we do a lot. The gender rate person is a very nice visual aid to describe how we think about people these days. Now, gender identity is who you feel you are. So when we talk about sex versus gender, biological sex is, it's the bits, it's the plumbing. Your biological sex is what the doctors use when you're born to go, oh, this is the kind of baby you have. Your gender identity can, for the most part, probably I would say 96 to 97% of the time, line up with your biological sex. And in that case, we would say that you are a cisgendered person. So that means your plumbing and who you feel you are line up. Now, if your gender identity do not line up with your bits, which means that maybe you were assigned female at birth, but you identify as male, that is what we would call transgender. So gender identity is a self-defined construct. It is who you feel that you are. Now, gender expression is how you tell people that. So in the olden days, which I mean the ripe olden days of, say even five years ago, a lot of the transgender kids I saw, if they identified as male, they wanted to be the boyest boys who's ever boyed. So I would see young people who go, I was assigned female at birth, but I identify as male, and they would come into my office and there would be all the standard issue hallmarks of boyness. So I would be talking about hoodie, a bit of swagger, some baggy pants, oversized sneakers, the whole kit and caboodle. Now these days, now Generation Z are not necessarily so fussed about gender expression lining up with any of the others. For a lot of young people these days, your gender expression is either a rule to be followed or to be completely ignored. So I would see young people who tell me that, okay, I was assigned female at birth, I identify as male, I wear pants, but I've kind of got longish hair and I do like nail polish. And sometimes if I'm feeling pretty, I'll wear makeup. And that's okay. This is just how gender expression changes. A couple of hundred years ago, kings wore high heels. Um, in certain parts of India, men wear dresses. A lot of Scottish blokes wear dresses. So gender expression really is quite culturally bound and can be redefined. The newest mix in these are the two orange ones, which is sexually attracted to and romantically attracted to. Now, a couple of years ago, we didn't really split them up as much, but basically this means who you fall in love with versus who you might want to have sex with. So sexually attracted um, can be straight, can be gay, lesbian, pan, um, asexual, like a whole bunch of different ones, and romantically attracted to means who you actually fall in love with. If you don't understand this, just ask any of your clients and they'll be able to explain it to you usually. Now, AFAB and AMAB, I'm just going to make this window a little bit smaller. Count of that is obscuring. Oh, what I see. There we go. AFAB and AMAB are fairly old school terms that you might encounter in older, people, older patients. AMAB, I signed male at birth. AFAB assigned female at birth. Those are the assumptions made about your gender based on your visualization of genitals. Gender dysphoria generally is the feeling of unease between your gender identity and your biological sex, the bits. Now, um, if there are people online who feel brave and want to answer a question anonymously, I might put it to the group. Can you remember an age or a time when you realized you were not just a kid, but you were a kid with a gender? Anyone? Okay, I might skip to the slide. I remember my children seem to have read the textbook when they did this because when my eldest was four, 
my youngest was two and the joke that the youngest one made was to say to my oldest one oh ben is a girl and ben identifies as a boy and he was really really annoyed at his sibling for making that joke about him so the ages there is two and four so kohlberg um, wrote about gender identity development and, and said that gender identity at about the age of two is the ability to label yourself as a boy or a girl mind you they don't really have non-binary or anything fluid at that time although on the internet you'll see kids a little bit older talking about different constructs gender stability kind of comes at about the age of four which is what my son did and that is that gender stays constant over time. I was born a boy and I will grow up to be a boy. Um, they do get a little bit confused in that if somebody has, say, if they have only ever seen women with long hair and you get a short haircut, they might assume that you've changed genders. But by about the age of six or seven, they, they, they think that that is, they don't think that that's accurate anymore. And they can go, oh, that lady had a haircut, but she is still a lady. My sister-in-law, um, after she had chemo, had very short hair and, and, and a flat chest. She had um, double mastectomy. And she remembers a kid, sort of five-ish, going, Mom, that boy over there. And she's like, no, not a boy. If we talk about gender dysphoria in children, as is described in the DSM-5, it looks distinctly different than gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults. And that is directly um, a reflection of these different stages of gender development. In the DSM-5, the gender dysphoria in children, you need about six of these, and they need to have been persistent, insistent, and consistent for more than six months. And versus for adolescents and adults, you need at least two. So that's quite different. And they'll talk about an alternative form of the gender assigned versus in the DSM-5, it is girls or boys for children. And the important thing to remember around this is as it is with everything in the DSM. If this causes significant impairment in function, that's when we start labeling it. Otherwise, if you just identify as different, but you can kind of just wing it, you don't necessarily need um, a label for it. Um, and certainly I'll talk about that a little bit later. Why does it matter having a diagnosis? It matters because we seem to be seeing more gender diverse young people these days, and we seem to be talking about it an awful lot, but it is still really a low prevalence condition. About 0.7% of children and young people under the age of 18, max of about 1.8%. Um, and that's quite different from kids who just behave as the opposite sex from time to time. Generation Z, um, which is the current cohort of young people. The alphas are so little, I don't know a lot about them, but Z certainly is the bulk of who I see. They seem very unbothered by gender expression. They seem to want to wear what they want and identify how they want, and which is great, and that's fine, and that's not a problem we start sort of labeling things by the time they show up to our door, either wanting particular treatments or they present with other mental health conditions. Now, although we talk about this in terms of a generational thing, we also do need to acknowledge that gender diversity has been around for yonks. It is hardly new. Um, we talk in Aboriginal culture about brother boys and sister girls. Now, I, I am not Aboriginal, so what I have, this is from what I've read and what I've been told, brother boy is another word for a trans boy and sister girl is another word for uh, a trans girl. You also get the um, Fafapini, which are the third gender people of Samoa. 
not that Fopofini are necessarily transgender, but certainly a percentage of them are. Gender dysphoria is definitely not a choice. I have never encountered anybody rolling up to my door going, you know what, I decided that I want to be part of a minority group and this is the one that I picked and I fully commit to having um, all the minority stress that goes along with being a minority, so this is my lifestyle choice. The truth is though that people have looked at lots of different theories about why are some people gendered, why are some people transgender and why are some people cisgender. They have looked at a lot of different things around um, the attachment relationship between your primary caregiver, they've looked at exposure to trauma, they have looked at hormones in the meat, um, the influence of the internet, there's certainly been a lot written about it and looked at, but the general scientific consensus as it currently stands is that this is a normal variation of human development. It is just something that is. So then why does it live in the diagnostic books? It lives in the diagnostic books as basically a hangover from the olden days when, and if you remember in the olden days, even homosexuality lived in the mental health books. It lives in the mental health books currently as a hangover, but also if someone is diagnosed with gender dysphoria as a diagnosis, it does allow us to use existing health structure, i.e. Medicare, um, to support someone's journey to self-acceptance um, and, dare I say, it, happiness. So, as I tell the kids, I'll diagnose you with this if it makes sense for you. And if you have this diagnosis, then we can use it to get you treatments. And then at the same time, we'll talk about how it seems kind of silly in that we're saying it's normal, but then it's also not. When you make the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, it's incredibly important to um, be as open-minded as possible, but also to keep in mind what else you could be looking at. So one of the biggest roles of mental health in gender diversity is to go, okay, is what I'm seeing gender dysphoria or something that looks like it. The differential diagnosis is, is, is quite wide. So we're looking at anything from a body dysmorphic disorder, which is primarily cosmetic. It's an ever-changing um, point of good enough. Oh, I'll be happy once I've done the nose. Oh, the nose is not ready. Maybe I'll do the nose again. Oh, and now the cheekbones are not ready. Oh, and now the buttocks need to be bigger. Oh, now, now the ones need to be smaller. Oh, now this, oh, now that. So body dysmorphic disorder isn't particular about gender or sex or the sex organs. It is about an, a cosmetic ideal and it's ever changing. We also talk about it in terms of complex PTSD or exposure to trauma. Um, is this maladaptive coping strategy to try and make sense of something heinous that happened. Um, and in that same token, we talk about dissociative identity disorder, which in itself is as rare as hen's teeth. But in the gender diverse population, we do need to keep it in mind. Um, and that first one, non-conformity to stereotypical sex role behaviors, is not a diagnosis that you'll find in a textbook it's one that I wrote down one day for a patient who um, was assigned female at birth and wanted to wear the shorts to school because she didn't want to wear the dress to school. And she was quite clear that she doesn't want to be a boy and she doesn't want to wear, um, be seen as a boy or talk to us. She's a girl who just doesn't like skirts. So this kid got so distressed because her school kept on making her wear dresses to school. Um, and she just wanted to wear the pants, so I ended up diagnosing her 
after a couple of sessions and really untangling as many of the threads as I could. She's not gender diverse, she just wants to wear shorts. So I ended up diagnosing her with non-conformity to stereotypical sex role behaviors and used that as um, a starting point to try and get her school. Clear wear pants. There are a number of comorbid conditions that do travel alongside gender diversity. We're talking about depression, panic and anxiety disorder, and then one in five um, participants in the first Australian national trans mental health study said that they had thoughts of suicide ideation or self-harm. This is not necessarily that being transgender causes these things, but certainly having gender dysphoria and disliking your body so much that you can't shower, that it's hard to even leave the house. It's hard when people don't get it. Um, and now you're part of a minority group and you may or may not be accepted by your family. These things all increase your risk factors. Um, I'll talk about ASD since that is definitely something that we're seeing more of in gender diverse clinics than in, I'd say, the general population. Um, there are a number of theories of why, around why this may or may, why this phenomenon is occurring, and a lot of them actually kind of sounds quite condescending if you look at them too closely. So the take-home message is, at the moment, we know that there are more young people on the autism spectrum who are just reporting to be gender diverse. We don't really know why or what that means, but we approach every person as being able to at least um, know who they are, and we will apply the same rigorous assessment schedule to them. Um, eating behaviour or body image disturbances is a fairly new thing that I'm certainly encountering more now that I'm working with Maple Leaf House. The lifetime prevalence for anorexia, bulimia and binge eating disorders are higher among sexual minority adults. Um, and certainly we have seen um, that for some people who identify as male, some of them might purposefully restrict their intake so that their body can stay as neutral as possible. And on the flip side, some young people who identify as female might also want to, um, or also develop disordered eating so that they can look as slim as possible because that is always um, the cultural expectation of men to be burly and for women to be um, skinny and elongated. Um, most of the young people um, who struggle with anxiety and feel like they're out of control, some of them will also develop disordered eating behaviour. We encounter a bit of a problem when we are assessing these young people because which growth chart do you use? Um, and so this is definitely something that we're looking into at the moment. But the good news is that if you treat someone's gender dysphoria with gender affirming care, it does increase body satisfaction. And for a lot of um, young people, it does improve their mental health um, and their anxiety overall. I might stop just at this point. Um, to see if people have any questions. Okay, so one has come through, um, Yolandi, and it's about, um, can you discuss the connection between ASD and gender dysphoria? Uh, beyond what I've already said? I think you've pretty much covered it, but yes, that's the only question that's come through so far. So, okay. yeah, so, so far, um, so far, like I think for a while there was this notion that some young people who are on the autism spectrum might choose, quote unquote, to change, quote unquote, genders because they're not very successful. So um, someone who was assigned female at birth might choose to be male because they find that they fit in more with the male cohort, especially if they're on the autism spectrum or the other way around. But that's actually really incredibly offensive and quite untrue. 
Um, I have seen upwards of 50 young people who um, are on the autism spectrum and are gender diverse and they have a lot like you know when you've met one person on the spectrum you've met one person on the spectrum you, know, you can't make these sweeping generalizations but for the most part the kids that I've seen um, are able to without a lot of bells and whistles tell me why they feel the way that they do um, and it has nothing to do with other people it's not to do with themselves I feel that I am not a girl I feel that I am a boy um, and certainly everything that I've read about speculative theories I feel um, is along that similar line of speculative theories around socialization and expectations but for the most part the kids will just tell me this is who I am this is how I want to be in the world not so that I can have more friends the other way around Thank you. And the only other question that's come through so far is, uh, can you cover ways to access services privately um, in a timely fashion? I understand how busy Maple Leaf is at the moment. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because um, no. yeah, that, is, that is the million dollar question. There yeah. are just not an awful lot of providers around. Accessing anything privately for anyone who's ever tried to refer anyone privately for anything will know that timely and private um, are for all intents and purposes mutually exclusive, unfortunately. Um, a good starting point is always to go to the OSPATH website um, and click on the providers tab because at least there you will find a list of providers in your neck of the woods. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, um, it is very hard to find people who do this work um, in private. Um, I do this work in private, my, my books have been closed for the last two years because I am part-time, like a lot of people are part-time um, and certainly a lot of clinicians that I speak with about um, doing gender diverse care are part-time. So. It's difficult for a lot of reasons. There are not many of us, and the ones that are our part time. So, sorry. <laughs> okay, and the last one before, and if anyone else has any further questions, pop them in the chat box and we'll get them to them at the end of the session. But the last one before we move on is um, do most people um, have a sense of this from birth, or when does it generally appear, and how many people experience GD in usual growth and development and end up not having? any gender dysphoria oh that's a i love that question and it kind of like i'll it'll slot back into sort of the talk then um okay the story that we have been sold for a very long time was that kids who are gender diverse know from day dot and certainly if you watch any of these like lifetime movies or any documentaries from louis um through and any of those through that guy um it'll be the story of you know, she has always known, you know, she's always wanted to wear my high heels ever since she was a baby, or he never played with the dolls, he always played with the trucks. That's the minority. Really, I think that that story becomes popular because it takes, um, it puts all of the responsibility on the child. This is just how this kid came out. It is a very easy to sell story in, in an age where easy to sell stories um, sell easily. Uh, certainly um, what I have observed and literally I've not found this in any um, research that I've done to try and corroborate my observations is there would be a cohort of kids probably I would think the minority of young people that get referred to me that I've identified as gender diverse since, since pre-pubertal pre age. Most of the kids I see realize that they are gender diverse as they hit puberty because that's really when your body votes isn't it your body votes in a direction and then for a lot of kids they go hey i'm not comfortable with this um, if we look at outcomes the studies for longitudinal outcome is it's variable in quality because um, if you look at them too closely you'll see that some studies have counted um, of I call it D sisters and first sisters. And certainly one of the big studies that have been quoted for a long time, if you actually look at the methodology, 
they counted these sisters as kids lost to care. So that means that if the parents chose not to bring the kid back to the clinic, they got a tick in the box of these sisters, whether that was true or not. If kids moved out of area, they got a tick for these sisters, whether that was true or not. So method methodology was flawed in one of the biggest studies that we have. Um, you know, the thing is, whether or not they change their mind is always going to be incredibly complicated because nobody wants to do the wrong thing. Mental health, we don't have a blood test. We can't do an x-ray to see that the bone is broken. We do the best we can with what we've got. If I think about the kids that I've seen, a small percentage of them would come out, come out as prepubertal. And even then, I don't do much work with the young person. I've talked mostly to the parents and they come out as adolescents. Um, I love the idea of just holding space. Um, and I, I actually really like our current treatment paradigm where by if you go into puberty up until like 15 and small change, there is no permanent option available for you. You cannot, I, I, I cringe every time some politician says, something along the lines of children's genitals being surgically mutilated. It's like, honey, no. Up until 15 and small change, there is nothing permanent on the table. And the idea behind that is all we're doing is we're holding space. We're taking gender and, and, and which way the wind might blow out of the equation. We're treating you the way that you want to be treated. Um, and if that improves your mental health and you can actually focus on getting to school, making friends, figuring out what you want to do when you grow up without worrying that your boobs are going to grow or your voice is going to break. I think that that is ultimately a good outcome. In the seven years that I've seen gender diverse young people, I can truly say that I have had two prepubertal kids, kind of th two prepubertal kids kind of rock up and go, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not a boy anymore or I'm not a girl anymore, depending on which way. So that's two. I have seen one adolescent who presented for two appointments saying, I identify as a trans male. So they were assigned female at birth and identified as male. We were still in assessment phase before they stopped coming to see me. And when they came back to see me uh, two years later, they said, oh yeah, no, that was just a phase. I'm a girl and I'm very happy with that. So that kid wasn't even in treatment. That kid was in assessment phase. And currently I have one young person who um, is saying, I am not sure if I should have transition. So that is out of approximately two hundred and fifty kids that I've seen in the last seven years. So they are out there, but they that is rare. We talk about it in terms of little kids who are gender who identify as gender diverse. Probably a third of them, they'll just grow out of it. It'll just be a phase. It'll be like I dressed as Elsa a lot because Frozen came out. And probably a third of them will end up not being straight. You know, so it'll be more of like who they're actually going to be attracted to one day and about a third of them will stay gender diverse. If we look at adolescents, the numbers are significantly higher for kids who stay the distance. Um, and because the research is really quite um, political, the numbers will be anything from 46% to 97% of persistence rates. If you look at kind of like my observations, is up to, I would say, 98% of kids who, who stay. I don't know what the numbers look like in grown-ups because I don't see grown-ups. Um, and I guess that's, that is always one of the things, but I like to think that we hold space for kids so that they can figure out who they are. And that was a very long answer and I kind of like smooshed a couple of slides into there as well. Um, so let me know in the comment box if you're not happy with that or if you've got more questions. Um, do, do, do. What do we actually do? What do you actually bloody do? So get the referral. I can tell you what I do because um, 
<laughs> I'm sure different people do it differently. So you can take anything from like one session to as many sessions as you need. And at any given point in time, I've got kids that I could have could do the diagnosis and the treatment plan in one session, but I also actively have kids that um, I've seen for a couple of years and we're still working it out. There is no one size fits all. Usually what I do is um, I meet with the young person and the family together at the first appointment and then um, I'll ask them, what do you want out of the appointment? If the young person is comfortable, I'll talk to them separately from their parents and then to the parents separately from them. If they are very little, if they're preview virtual, they can go and stay with me. So then that appointment is usually pretty short and I'll spend more time with the parents or even spend a time together and then book a follow-up appointments as required with the parents to see what they would like. Um, I will ask the young person, and, I'll, and I've worked on this for quite a while to try and hopefully make it as unoffensive as possible. So I'll say some people have a different name that they like to use um, as opposed to the name on their Medicare. What would you like me to call you and what pronouns do you use? That's twofold. That makes it clear to the kid what my job is, and it also makes it clear. And I can watch how the rest of the room responds. So if there's cringes or like stink eye, or the kid says, I don't know, and that's different when the parents are not around, it gives you a bit of an idea about the vibe. With everybody in the room, I'll talk about what the assessment process is. Then really, that it is determined by the people in the room. I have no agenda. I don't get queer box every time I turn someone or I don't get um, straight box every time I don't. My job is to try and understand the young person and to figure out if there's anything I can do to help. I'll talk about what the role of mental health and medical folks are and then we'll do a bit of psychoeducation mostly around origin theories of gender diversity. Um, now this fourth point here, the young person's capacity to give informed consent is paramount in gender medicine. Um, and, and I'll try and circle back to that. Particularly what it comes down to is, if I'm going to ask some 10 year old, listen, do you want to have surgery to change your genitals? I am such an asshole because there is no way that a 10 year old's got the brain power to understand that question. Capacity is about a specific treatment that is applicable to a specific person at that point in time. And even if you are a smart 10 year old, or even if you are a very smart adolescent, you don't have your frontal lobe yet. So that's why we need parental consent. We borrow the parents' frontal lobe. So we'll ask the kid about what the treatments are that they want. Is it realistic? Is it safe? Is it doable? Um, are there other alternatives? Have they thought about it? Do they think that this is going to magically solve all their problems? And if we feel, okay, kids at least got something, and then the parents go, yeah, no, then we can't do anything. If the parents go, yeah, toss, then, then we can progress with treatment. Um, do an awful lot of liaison with other providers. God bless you if, you if I ever see one of your children, because you will get so many letters, you would really want for me to just shut up and stop writing you letters. Also look at what other supports they have. We do the irregular like assessment, this whole family tree. I try to understand the kid as an actual person, like what do you like? Um, we joke a bit about in, in, in the business about like what's the kind of anime that you like? Because a lot of kids don't like anime. Um, we'll talk about developmental history, physical and mental health and risk issues. Um, for little people, We'll, we'll not delve into all of that as much, but we'll say, do you want to draw a picture of yourself, like as you currently are, or what you would like to look like when you're all grown up? And I make no assumptions. It's hard because you do um, these assessments like quite often. I'll try and like really like just be like, I'm going to ask you some questions that are going to be difficult, um, and I'll give them a trigger warning beforehand, and then I'll just kind of launch into it. And I'll use very bland language purposefully. So I'll use words like your plumbing, upstairs, downstairs, top or bottom. Um, not because I'm trying to be hip, but because for some children, if you use the proper names, as we're taught to do, it's really quite unsettling. So I try and just make the assessment that's already like really personal, as least painful as possible. So I'll ask the kids, how do you figure out your gender identity? How long have you felt that way? What would you like to look like? 
because every journey is individual. Who did you tell? How did that go? We'll talk a bit about their body. Which parts do they struggle with? Can they shower without the stress? Can they get dressed while looking in the mirror? Or do they have to like be all closed eyes and then move on? Do they bind? Um, do they talk? Um, how do they cope with their periods? And then we'll ask about coping and if they feel supported. So coping is, I like that question because again, it tells me something about the person, but it also gives me an idea of if they cope by using lots of drugs, I've got a whole other set of questions I need to ask. Do not assume that everybody wants all the things. Before I started doing this work, I had an idea that all the kids want all the things. They want operations of the wazoo. The reality is my, some kids want none of that, some kids want all of it. I won't know until I ask. And I'm also not practicing gender affirming care. If I make an assumption that this kid wants something because I think that's what they should want. It's not about what I think or what they should. It's about what do they want and is that safe and realistic. For the pet, um, I, I'll quickly stop. Okay. Um, do anyone have, does anyone have any questions about sort of like the kid part of the assessment? Just having a look for you. Um, okay. How would you how would you approach uh, pre parents that are very rigid and blocking an adolescent from even having the discussions and exploring? Yeah. Okay. That's really tricky. Um, okay. I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. So for the parent, I'll talk about a temperament and what were their preference. Did they have a particular preference for toys or friends or clothes? And we'll ask, you know, did anything ever happen that they really wish they didn't? For the parents, I'll ask, how do they feel? What do they know about the next steps? How do they feel about the whole thing? Do they want to be linked in with any support groups? In my private rooms, there's a couple of steps that the kid needs before they're able to see me. So they would have had to tell their parents, they would have had to go to the GP, they would have had to get a referral, and then they have to show up here. Um, if they told their parents and the parents went, yeah, no, they don't go to the GP or do any of the other things. If they went with their parents to the GP and the GP referred and the parents went, okay, now we've got, but yeah, no then they don't get to see me. If they show up to the first appointment with me and the parents go, this is BS, and they come for one appointment and never bring the young person back, that's really crummy. So in my private rooms, a lot of the people I see, I'm kind of, they demonstrate less rigidity by the fact that they brought their kid in than maybe some other parents. But even in saying that, um, I have had kids that I've seen, I can think particularly of, of, I can think of a few, where the parent brought the kid back for appointment after appointment and at every appointment told me how this is not really what's happening, this is just this or this is just that. And then when I start putting the pressure on going, listen, this is what your kid has been telling me for the last nine months. Maybe you should start believing them and then they don't come back. Um, and then I don't really know what happens to the kid. In, in some of my other jobs, um, like at my belief or, or even in my role at, at CAMS, um, sometimes you'll see those kids whose parents didn't follow up and they would usually present with the whole litany of mental health things or they wouldn't even present with like gender, it would just be mental health things and then you'll ask and then that'll come out and then the parents would just go no this is bullshit um, or no this is not I don't believe this um, and the truth is it's just really crummy because um, if a kid had severe asthma and their parents kept on smoking around them and they refused to take them to the doctor and they refused to fill their scripts for their um, inhalers, you could make a DCJ report about that or at least call child wellbeing unit. It usually doesn't do much if you do that for gender medicine because 
people have lots of attitudes around it. Um, but we try because we go, this is what we've recommended based on a thorough assessment and the parent is still not doing the things. Um, another option is um, we just keep on talking to the parents and see if we can, even if we can't get them on board with using the kids as like getting the kid on testosterone, we might talk to the parent about, okay, 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 so I hear you. We just do a lot of validation and then we might, would you consider that your child might go on the oral contraception to control the periods because they're so distressed by the time the periods come that they don't go to school or they engage in mental health dangerous behaviors and sometimes you can get some movement and then you just do parallel work with the kids where you go let's just see what we can do better while you're here um, so we'll always try and and go with reversible interventions that parents might be able to get on board with um, if we encounter um, a scenario whereby one parent is on board and the other one isn't if they are separated. An option is family law court. We don't like actively encourage it or like stoke the fires of division. We just talk about it in terms of these are your options. Um, and some people do go, okay, I'm gonna do that. Um, but it's always difficult. Um, so, I have had parents where we've talked to them lots and at the end of it they go, you know what, I don't think I'll ever agree with this, but thank you for talking to me. Um, I also had parents who go, um, who've had various sort of like really unpleasant things to say about their children. There is no magical solution to um, softening the rigid parent just like there's no sort of one size fits all. So basically we do as much as we can um, while at the same time trying to patch the kid up. But it is really crummy if you know what will make it better and then they don't want to do those things. Does that answer that? Is that a sad answer? <laughs> no, that's great. Um, and the other one is too many people come saying they are non-binary and where do you take this? Oh, okay. So, yeah, so, okay, so seven years ago, everybody jumped ship from one end to the other. Yep, like, I am pink, I want to be blue, I am blue, I want to be pink, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now, now they come and they go, okay, I am blue and I kind of want to be purple, or I am pink and I want to be purple, or every now and then somebody rolls up and they go, I am agender. And honestly, truly, um, I can roll with a lot because I've practiced rolling with a lot, but it is always like you always kind of go, okay. <sighs> Non-binary is a valid gender identity in its own right. So if we talk about gender identities, you get trans man, trans woman, you know, but you also do get like agender, you get gender fluid, you get um, non-binary, you get, like the other day I heard a new one, gender fawn which is somebody who identifies as not as transmasculine. So they're predominantly bluer, but never pink, but they're not full blue. Um, I approach it as I do the ones who jump ship from one end to the other. Okay, how can I help? So some kids who are non-binary might go, okay, I identify as non-binary, I really don't wanna get my periods. And then we go, cool, what can I do to help with that? Whereas some kids might identify as non-binary and they go, I want to be on testosterone for a little bit, maybe a couple of years or so, and then I don't want to be on testosterone anymore because then, then I'm androgynous enough. So non-binary, it's androgynous. So <laughs> Gen Z, <laughs> Gen X, like my generation, we had androgynous. We had like, we grew up with our parents listening to like that Bowie and, um, pretty mercury and, and really kind of like that wildness of the 70s. Non-binary is basically a newer generation's version of that. So I go, okay, what do you want out of treatment? Occasionally when I talk to young people about their gender journey, they will tell me that I first realized something was off, like it just didn't sit right. And then they'll go, I thought maybe I was not straight. So they'll say, okay, I thought maybe I was a lesbian. 
And then I thought about it a bit more and then I was like, no, 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 I'm gender fluid. I go, okay. And then they'll go, you know what? And then I thought about it a bit more and then I'm like, I'm actually non-binary. I'm like, okay. And, they said, and then I thought about it a bit more, but I'm actually a trans man. So that thing of changing mind isn't a change of mind. It is literally such a big deal to be gender diverse. I see it as these kids trying it on for size because they're trying to find a way that they can exist in the world that is not as difficult. So some kids who are non-binary will, that is actually who they are and they've thought about it and that's who they are. For some young people, non-binary is a step in the thing. Um, I approach it as much of muchness. What, how can I help and what do you want out of treatment? So um, I get a little bit like annoyed if people go, oh, there's so many genders these days. I'm like, what does it matter? Um, really, what does it matter? Um, I know who I am. Um, my job is to try and understand the person in front of me. And if I have to do a bit of mental gymnastics, it does make my job interesting. But yeah, I hope that's answered your question about non-binary and kind of like where it fits in. But they're basically just like not even the people who jump ship from one end to the other want all of the things. The non-binary kids might go, I want this treatment, but not that. Or they might go, I want a bit of it, but not forever. Um, my job is to kind of go, do you have gender dysphoria? Does that, I hope that that answers that question. Yes, um, thank you so much. Yeah, cool. that's great. Um, we talked a little bit about competency. Um, and these ones I'll leave you to, um, to read. Um, because uh, the last thing, the last thing I'll say before I um, give it to Mel, um, from my belief is if you think that you cannot do this work and if this is just not in your comfort zone and you don't even want to do it, my recommendation will be don't. Um, it's best that you don't open the door when someone's knocking and open the door and try and change their mind um, or purposefully misgender or cannot wrap your head around it. If you have, if this job makes you too uncomfortable and you're like, listen, I cannot reconcile this with who I am as a person, you know, that's actually really okay. Um, just go, yeah, no, this is not, this is not for me. And end the conversation there, um, because that will be significantly less damaging than going, oh, but are you sure? Have you tried? Have you done this? Have you done that? You should, you know, find a sport or go to a church. Like that's not okay. And we say that because people have been doing that for a long time and it doesn't work. So um, I will just leave you with that. Like if you like reflect on your discomfort and your own barriers to implementation and honor yourself. If you really feel this is not my bag, then it's not your bag. There's plenty of other people around with different diagnoses and maybe they'll be your bag. Um, okay, I'll stop talking now. Um, if they, I'll give it to Mel um, so that she can do her part of the presentation. Thank you so much and over to you, Mel. Thank you so much, Yolandi, that was awesome. Um, I am just trying to figure out how to Share my screen. Yep, we've got your screen up, Mel. We've just got your uh, Hunter New England LHD page up. So if you just want to bring up the presentation. Perfect. Can you see that now without the um, note? No. No. I know you're working off two screens, so it's probably on the other screen. Yep. What can you see at the moment? Uh, the Hunter New England LHD uh, logo page. Um, okay. Let me just see. Stop. And if anyone has any questions, uh, we will get those to those at the end. So pop them into the chat box. Uh, also, a copy of the presentations will be available in the Education Library in the coming days as well. And Mel, your medical transition uh, presentation is on the screen now. Great, thank you for that. Okay, yeah. um, I'm just going to Okay, 
All right. Um, so I'm glad that you can see my screen now. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, sorry about that. My name is Mel and I am a clinical nurse consultant um, from John Hunter Children's Hospital. And I'm currently working in the fields of endocrine and trans and gender diverse medicine at Maple Leaf House in Newcastle, which you Andy spoke about. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about medical transition. And just to be upfront, um, I'm not a prescriber, so I'm not able to speak from the perspective of a prescriber, but I'll give a bit more of a broader and lighter overview of the medical transition process. Okay. So um, firstly, there's two documents out that provide clear guidelines for trans and gender diverse medicine. Um, and they are the Australian Standards of Care and Treatment Guidelines for Trans and Gender Diverse Young People, which was developed by um, RCH in Melbourne, and the Australian Informed Consent Standards of Care for Gender Affirming Hormone Therapy, um, which has only recently been released in March this year, and it's been put out by the Australian Professional Association for Trans Health, um, or better known as OSPATH. Um, and OSPATH is the peak body in Australia for professionals involved in this area of medicine. Um, a lot of the information in this presentation comes from these two resources and they're both very easily accessible just via your computer search engine. Okay, um, so I just um, think it's really important to note that with medical transition, it is only just one part of gender affirmation and uh, each person's journey um, may look a little different in terms of their goals and their desired outcomes. So as Yolandi said, um, you know, not everybody wants to identify as male or female. There's a lot in between, um, including the, the non-binary categories. Um, so it's just really important to establish a treatment plan with the patient and also important to not assume that we know what the patient wants. Okay, so when a patient is considering a medical transition, we have to operate within the Australian law. So currently under the age of 18, um, the patient and both parents or whoever has parental responsibility has to provide written consent uh, to medical treatment for gender affirming hormones and or puberty blockers. So um, if there's any dispute in this, if there's one parent absent or um, one parent disputing this, then it does need to go to family law court for a ruling um, and no treatment can be commenced. Uh, over the age of 18, um, a young person can or an adult can access um, gender affirming hormones under an informed consent model um, and that can be initiated by a GP um, and in this model of care psych assessment and gender dysphoria diagnosis is not required unless there is concern about the person's capacity to understand what they're consenting to so if there are any concerns about capacity to understand the proposed treatment then um, a psych assessment is recommended. Okay, um, oops, sorry, my slides are playing up. Um, so for patients who are seeking a medical transition, the first step is to conduct a holistic assessment just to gain more information about the patient. So I kind of think of it as an information exchange. Um, in our clinic, we use an intake assessment, which is based on a HEADS assessment. Um, and it's usually an hour long assessment where we get to know the person, um, and we follow the line of curious questioning to ask about their pronouns and their gender identity, um, their gender journey to this point, and any of the uh, gender incongruence that they may have experienced. We also like to um, get an idea of what their expectations are of treatment. And at this point in time, we'd also gain a full medical history, including family history. Um, as part of the HEADS assessment, we ask about home life, education and employment, um, activities and interests, drugs, alcohol, sex and relationships, um, self-harm, suicide, self-image and safety and abuse. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the HEADS assessment. Um, a, mental risk, a, a mental health risk assessment is also used at this point 
um, just to identify risk to self and others. And we also do drug and alcohol screening um, and sexual health screening, um, again, to identify any risks in those areas. Um, this assessment also provides a great opportunity to discuss family planning and ask the patient if they have any sort of clear ideas about family planning in the future. So we would usually ask open-ended questions like, what does family life look like for you in the future? Or, you know, if you could picture yourself in 10 years from now, what would your ideal family um, life look like? Just to get them thinking about um, that. Okay, so um, when a patient is considering medical transition, it's so important, as I'm sure everybody knows, with any sort of treatment, um, to spend time talking about the proposed treatment, so to spend time talking about hormones, about their effects, and ensure that the patient is provided with all the information needed um, to be able to make a fully informed decision about starting on gender-affirming hormones. So some of the things um, that we would usually discuss or in, including that discussion would be um, what the patient's understanding and expectations of treatment are, again, um, the likely effects and adverse effects of the treatment, limitations of the treatment, um, such as things that the hormones won't change. So um, things like neck structure or height, or um, you know, we wanna make sure that they don't have a uh, misguided idea that maybe um, starting on testosterone will make their breasts shrink, things like that. So just making sure that we address um, the limitations of the treatment. And then also providing um, a possible timeline for those changes to occur. So what can they expect and, and what sort of timeline can they expect? That can be a hard one because it does differ for um, everybody. Um, we also would discuss irreversible changes, so things like um, voice deepening for trans masculine people and breast development for trans feminine people. Um, and we'd also discuss the potential for infertility and offer referrals to a fertility specialist for fertility preservation. Um, I always think it's really important to use um, providers who you know are trans and gender diverse friendly. And if you have a look on Health Pathways, there is a link to some providers um, in the local area. Um, so it's really important, obviously, to consider, for the, the young people to consider fertility, um, um, but particularly for the trans feminine people, as estrogen may lead to permanent infertility. Um, and so we would recommend sperm analysis and freezing prior to commencing gender affirming hormones. Um, However, like we still have to respect that it is a personal decision and patients may have different views about the importance of their fertility and um, what their plans are for the future. Okay. Um, so before, before beginning medical transition, uh, the following baseline investigations should be undertaken. So bloods, um, including full blood count, liver function, electrolytes, hormones, um, vitamin D, and HCG if it's indicated or requested by the, the patient. Um, we'd also consider lipids, um, fasting glucose, and a HbA1c if it's indicated. Most of our patients would have um, lipids, glucose, and HbA1c done prior to starting any sort of um, gender-affirming hormone treatment. Um, we'd also make sure that we have a baseline documentation of vital signs as well as height and weight. And a bone mineral density scan may be indicated for patients who are going to start on puberty blockers. Um, but we usually wouldn't recommend that that is done until they've actually had their psych assessment um, for those that are under 18. Um, just because it, I guess you want to avoid um, unnecessary exposure to x-rays and, and um, that they may not necessarily have needed if they don't meet the criteria and can't go on to have the treatment. Um, bone mineral density can also be indicated in um, older patients as well if there is a high risk of developing osteoporosis. So when we're talking about medical transition, the hormones that we use are gonadotropin releasing hormone analogs, such as Zolodex and Lupin, um, androgen blockers, such as spironolactone and cyproterone, and of course, estrogen and testosterone.
So puberty blockers or GnRH analogs are used um, to stop the pituitary gland from producing hormones that promote production of secondary sex hormones. So um, the puberty blockers are used in trans and gender diverse medicine um, to reduce distress associated with the body changes and, and give the young person some time to explore their gender um, without the pressure of the body changing. The puberty blockers are ideally commenced around Tanner stage two um, of puberty, um, which is usually around the age of 11 to 12, um, but obviously very individualized. Um, and the, the blockers are usually continued until the young person either um, commences gender affirming hormones. So we would usually have a, a crossover period of approximately nine to 12 months of blockers with hormones, um, which can be commenced at age 16, occasionally age 15 if clinically indicated, um, or until the young person wishes to discontinue. So, you know, before they reach that age of, of wanting to start on hormones, they may have decided that actually I'm okay with um, the gender I was assigned at birth or I don't want to continue with medical treatment. I'm happy with just, um, you know, a social affirmation model. Um, puberty blockers do have an effect on bone mineral density, hence the need for the bone mineral density scan. Um, and so it's obviously not a long-term use medication. So at um, Maple Leaf House, we use Zolodex um, because that is what is provided. Um, and it is, I'm sure a lot of you have given Zolodex before, but for those who haven't, it's a deep subcutaneous injection. It is quite a large needle, it's a 16 gauge needle. Um, so we usually um, put some anaesthetic numbing cream on the skin before we inject. Um, and we usually inject into the abdominal area, preferably, um, occasionally for some of the young kids who are very thin, um, we might use the, the flank area. Um, so it comes as a preloaded uh, syringe and inside it is a tiny implant. It's approximately one to one and a half centimetres long um, and it's biodegradable, so it doesn't need to be removed. Um, we would usually start by giving off a smaller dose, so a 3.6 milligram dose, um, just to see how the patient tolerates it, um, to monitor for any side effects. Um, that it might cause. So some of the common ones that people report would be headaches or hot flushes, but most often they don't notice any change. Um, they may also experience like a, some PV bleeding after having, like within that first week of having that injection. Um, but if, if it's tolerated well, then we would move on to the bigger dose, which is the 10.8 milligrams. And it just provides a longer period between the injections. So we would usually give that 12 weekly. Okay, so um, the androgen blockers that we use at Maple Leaf House are commonly um, the cyproterone and the spironolactone. So, so proterone dose would be 12.5 to 25 milligrams daily and spironolactone would be 100 to 200 milligrams daily. Um, you need to, I guess one thing to be aware of would be the mood effects if the, the testosterone is oversuppressed, um, you know, and the risk of low mood. Um, there's also the risk of lower libido. Um, and possible risk to, of liver issues and meningioma. Okay, um, so talking about feminizing medication. So feminizing medications um, usually involves a combination of estrogen and androgen blockers, but be aware that not all patients will want to use both, um, or not, will not want to use the androgen blockers. Um, estrogen can be given by a transdermal patch, oral tablet, um, an estradiol gel or via an implant. Predominantly we would use the patches and the oral medications here um, in our clinic. Um, we, it's usually advised and, and we definitely do this with our patients to start at a lower dose um, for the first one to three months and then titrate up. And we aim to achieve estradiol levels between 250 to 1,000 and testosterone levels less than two. 
um, it's important to take into account, I guess, as well the clinical presentation and the patient goals um, to guide the titration and dosage. So um, some of the non-binary clients will use like micro doses um, because their, their goals or what they're trying to achieve um, may be different to someone who identifies as trans female or trans male. Um, okay, so this is just listing um, some of the effects and the timeline that may be expected of the estrogen therapy. I'm not going to read it all out to you, but um, because I, I guess just be mindful that these can be experienced differently by each patient. Um, so while it is a good guideline, um, it's not sort of something that we could quote, I guess, um, for every, it won't be tried and true for every single patient. Um, usually in our clinic, uh, the, the patients that we see report the skin softening and some sort of breast and nipple pain within the first three months. That's usually what is reported as the most noticeable effect initially. Um, but breast development can vary just as um, female puberty varies in, in everyone. Some of the adverse effects of estrogen listed here. Um, so I guess this is part of informed consent and making sure that the patients are informed of the, the possible adverse effects prior to commencing treatment. And then of course, monitoring for these effects after. I'm just gonna move on to testosterone now. So um, to achieve masculinization, we use testosterone. Um, usually comes in a transdermal gel or cream or via an intramuscular injection. And we aim for testosterone trough levels um, between 10 to 15. So we'd usually ask patients, especially if they're on an injection, we'd usually ask them to have their um, bloods taken just prior to the, the next injection, so a week before. Um, the testosterone can be subsidized by the PBS, but you need um, to consult with an endocrinologist, a sexual health physician, or a urologist. Um, that can be um, the patient going to see the consultant or the specialist, you can refer to the specialist, or you can um, have a conversation um, to do a consult on the patient's behalf. Um, when prescribing the IM testosterone, some patients may prefer to self-administer the testosterone. So in that case, we'd usually use um, the primatestin or the Suctanon injection. Um, it's a smaller volume and we would usually teach the patients how to inject that into their thigh. Um, but others will use the Reandron 1000, which is administered at the clinic. Um, it, usually given, so the, the primatestin and Sussman would be given every two to four weeks. Um, titrating obviously depending on um, the patient's, the clinical presentation of the patient and um, blood tests. Um, but the reandron is given every 12 weeks. So it's less frequent, but um, a much larger volume to inject. So it's four mils and all of the testosterone injections are made up in an oily substance, so quite thick to push. Okay, um, so again, just listing the effects and, and a bit of an expected timeline um, of testosterone. Usually for our transmasculine patients, um, they would usually report skin oiliness and acne, um, some mild voice deepening and increased hair growth and usually clitoral growth as well in the first three months. So that's usually the first effects that are noticed. Again, just listing the adverse effects that the patient needs to be informed of before commencing any treatment. Um, in the standards of care that I talked about at the start of this presentation, um, there's really, really great um, consent forms that you can use if you are wanting to initiate hormone treatment. It actually walks you through the whole process. It's great. Okay, and then of course, you know, after we've initiated um, treatment, we're going to uh, monitor and manage the patient. Um, 
appropriately. So, you know, gender affirming hormones might be a long life, a lifelong, sorry, therapy for some clients and for others, it may be a shorter term therapy to achieve certain aspects of medical transition. So again, sort of referencing those non-binary patients. Um, but once the treatment is started, it's always going to be important um, for the patient to be monitored. And um, just quoting the OSPATH standards again, they recommend three to four monthly bloods and a checkup in the first um, 12 months of starting, sorry, three to four monthly bloods and checkup in that first 12 months of starting gender affirming hormone treatment. And then six to 12 monthly bloods once stabilized. Um, regular monitoring of any of those unwanted or adverse effects like DVTs or acne, um, polycythemia, that's also important and hence um, you know, the three monthly checkups. And uh, education as well, ongoing education. So especially for those patients that are wanting to inject themselves, um, you know, making sure that they're in, able to inject correctly and safely. Um, and also just a general health and lifestyle checkup. So, you know, patients who are on hormones um, are going to be at an increased risk of cardiovascular um, effects. So, you know, just checking in and making sure um, and having that ongoing assessment of lifestyle factors and um, any other risk factors. Okay, so um, this is just the referral pathway for Maple Leaf House. So Maple Leaf House, like we said before, is um, run by New South Wales Health. It's a trans and gender diverse clinic. It's located in Hamilton in Newcastle um, and it provides holistic care for trans and gender diverse young people up to the age of 25, so up until their 25th birthday. Um, and if we are a statewide service, so we will see um, anyone within the state of New South Wales um, who identifies as trans and gender diverse. Um, the clinic houses a multidisciplinary team, so we do have adolescent physicians, we've got speech pathologist, dietitian, um, adult and paediatric endocrinology, allied health, the psych and nursing as well. Um, and our lead clinician is um, Dr. Robbie Tate, so any referrals made to the clinic should be made out to his name. Uh, our referral criteria, which is also listed on Health Pathways, um, is again, as I said, just up to the age of 25 um, and anyone who's wanting to access social and medical affirmation. Um, the only thing to note is that we don't currently have the capacity to manage comorbid mental health. So as much as we would like to be able to provide that sort of service, we just don't have the capacity. Um, we're getting referrals between sort of 10 to 15 new referrals every week. Um, so from a mental health perspective, we're really quite limited to assessments, um, gender dysphoria assessments and assessments for surgical intervention. Uh, I've just um, popped up the health pathways. Obviously, health pathways are a great resource for information. Um, it will give you a lot of information about the assessment and management of trans and gender diverse young people. Um, so I've just included the the pathways web address and the login information. Um, and that this can be accessed across professions, so across disciplines, sorry. Um, it also, if you log on to Health path Pathways, it'll provide information on the referral pathway um, and the, the names of the clinicians that you need to list on the referral. There's also a referral um, intake form that you can fill out and, and send on here as well. And then just, um, so that's that, sorry, forgot to click it over. <laughs> and then just listing a few of the resources or the, the um, groups that we use that are reputable and, you know, if you're wanting to, um, I guess, if you've got patients coming in that have questions and they're wanting to seek their own information, these are some of the, the websites that you might be able to direct them to.
and I'll just bring the last one back because I don't think I left it on for long enough, but that's, um, this is the username and password that you require to access Pulse Pathways and the, the web address to get there as well. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. I know we've gone over time a little bit tonight, but thank you so much for listening and um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions. Thanks so much, Mel and Yolanda. That was really fascinating and um, lots of questions are coming through. There's been lots of engagement since so Bullworth well running over time for that. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. the content is striking a note with everybody. So that's fantastic to hear. And there will be a copy of the presentation and a recording of this event as well available on our website for everyone to be able to refer to later. I've just got a couple of questions come, have, that have come through that I'll read out for you now. Um, so Central Coast patients, can they be referred to Maple Leaf uh, clinic. In the past we've been bouncing back for the referrals and, and we've had to refer to Sydney Westmead instead. So I, I know that your uh, availability is quite limited but I guess for the Central Coast that would be really good information to have. Yeah, so at the moment we are accepting referrals from the Central Coast. Um, there is a Sydney hub that's currently being developed um, and basically what we're trying to build is like a sister hub or like so that there's two services that are running very similarly um, but Sydney just haven't quite got their whole team there yet and the wait list for Sydney is quite long um, so at the moment we would accept referrals for Central Coast and Sydney as well at the moment. Okay and so the next question leads into that is what is the wait list for Maple Leaf? <laughs> Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. um, it varies between disciplines. So we usually, when we're doing intake, um, we try not to triage anyone to be seen for an intake assessment um, over a three month wait time. So everyone should be seen within three months for their initial intake assessment. Um, some patients, if there's increasing distress, um, then we may triage them for a 30 day um, intake assessment. So every patient that comes to Maple Leaf House will be seen by a CNC and they'll have that thorough assessment that we discussed um, earlier in the presentation. And then um, for the other disciplines, the site wait list is quite long um, because there's so few and far between and so we're very lucky to have Yolandi and the site team that we have here at Maple Leaf House but um, you're probably looking at a three to four month wait for um, a gender dysphoria assessment by a psychologist um, for puberty blockers and probably more like a six to eight month wait for a, a gender dysphoria assessment to start on gender affirming hormones. Um, to get in to see the medical teams, it's probably more like a four, somewhere between four to eight weeks. Um, okay. Another one that was surprising for us, we have a speech pathologist here and a lot of our patients have really loved engaging with our speech pathologist and, and love the service that she offers um, and that has led to an incredibly long wait list. So we're, we've definitely um, submitted for more um, you know, more people on the floor, but our, our speech pathologist wait list at the moment is about 10 months. Okay, um, and just a couple of uh, questions about preservation, um, fertility preservation. So can, can that be accessed publicly, A, and then um, what are the surgical management options? Who does them and how can they be done both privately and publicly funded? Yeah, so, um, in terms of the fertility preservation, it is not offered publicly. Um, we do offer a, so we do have a fertility specialist that's attached to John Hunter Children's Hospital. We often refer for fertility counselling. Um, so they can really just go over what some of the um, options are. But as for actually um, carrying out fertility preservation, we don't have a public option for that. It's all done through the private system. Um, having said that, I know that there is some sort of Medicare rebates or you know there, there is a, a Medicare yeah, rebate that you can get back. So I think for an initial consult, um, the 
Denea, I think it is, it's approximately $120 for the patient to go and see them and have, have that chat and have that in-depth discussion because, I mean, I'm not a fertility specialist, so obviously they can provide a little bit more insight into some of those um, strategies. Um, and then, sorry, what was the second part of that question? I've just removed it. <laughs> <laughs> the second part was about surgery. Um, yeah. So, um, so if you go again, to the OSPATH website, they will list a number of providers who do, who offer um, gender affirming surgeries. Uh, basically, um, I don't know of any on the Central Coast. In Newcastle, we've got. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say names. <laughs> I don't want to see as I'm promoting anybody, but um, there's a couple of um, plastic surgeons around who will do top surgery um, for um, gender affirming care. So either um, for trans men or trans females. As far as bottom surgery goes, I I honestly don't even want to tell you because I don't even actually even know. like I honestly can't tell you because I don't think that anybody does it. So as far as top surgery goes, there are some providers around. Um, Medicare will pay part of it um, if you have high level mental uh, high level private health insurance with full mental health coverage. They will um, subsidise some of the operations, but mostly um, it still incurs a significant out of pocket cost. Um, for the clients and their families. Um, there is uh, Dr. Merton is in Sydney and he offers some top surgery, so double mastectomy or the um, double incision mastectomy or the um, keyhole in, um, in his public teaching role, um, but that's not really advertised anywhere. That's just that we know of, but you have to see him in his private rooms and then talk to him about um, what you need and then you might be able to join that list. So it's really expensive and the government is not funding it. Um, there is currently a petition going around to um, review the clause where it's sort of seen as cosmetic because we're arguing that it really isn't um, because that will incur some more Medicare funding for it and there are no private uh, public hospitals that offer gender affirming care as part of their regular um, training schedules. So it's really difficult for young people to get access to surgery. Great. And the final question, uh, discussing contraception. Um, could we please touch on that? Yeah. Um, so I guess when we do our initial intake assessment, we ask about um, sexual activity and contraception. We have to tell, like it's very important to tell um, patients that, especially patients going on testosterone. So testosterone is not a contraceptive. So we do a lot of um, education and counseling around that. And um, I guess direct to more appropriate forms of contraception. It depends on you know, who they're wanting to have sexual intercourse with, of course. Um, so, you know, we'd still be promoting the use of condoms um, and um, marinas and things like that. At Maple Leaf, we also have a clinician called Joe. And Joe, um, we borrow Joe from the sexual health clinic. So if the client has a very specific um, questions around um, PrEP or, or just sort of like the non-standard, I guess, um, contraceptive advice, I would usually um, send them to job. Great. But okay. otherwise, Mel and Liz cover a lot of it in their initial appointment. Fantastic. Well, thank you both for being with us here tonight. It's been a really interesting topic um, and we can see that from the numbers we've received of attendees tonight and the questions and the engagement. Um, Olivia, I'll hand over to you if you'd like to have some final words, thank but I'd like to say thank, thank you to you, you both for being here. Um, it's been a great night. Really appreciate it. And I'll hand over to you, Olivia. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Dr. Goodyear. Thank you, Mel Davies. 
This has been an amazing presentation and by the number of questions that have come through from the GPs on the central course, it, it just indicates that this is such a relevant topic today. And Dr. Goodyear, thank you very much about uh, the short um, discussion we had around the um, connection between ASD and gender dysphoria. It is something that we see quite common within our referrals uh, from GPs and from the mental health presentations to ED. Um, so it, it is a topic that probably we might call on you again, if possible, Dr. Goodyear, to do another presentation in depth to explore the differences and, and where the connection is between uh, young persons that have autism and they have certain ideas around the gender. So thank you again, Mel, your presentation was amazing. Thank you, Dr. Goodyear, and thank you to all the GPs and my colleagues at CAMS and Headspace that have attended tonight. And thank you, Mel Wilkinson, your efforts are amazing. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you very much for having us. Have a lovely thank evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Night. Bye-bye. <laughs>